Hey, this is Warren Redlick. Thank you for watching. I am here with Bradford Ferguson of Halter Ferguson Financial. He mentioned on Twitter the other day that he had an interesting theory about how a company that we could invest in that might be related to Starlink closely enough that you it's you can't invest in Starlink right now. It's hard to invest in SpaceX, but this is a company that's publicly traded that may be a play in the in the Starlink space. Bradford is from Halter Ferguson Financial. He is a professional investment advisor, but this is not professional investment advice. <laughs> we are both still learning about this company. So Bradford, what what revelation did you stumble on that led you to say that on Twitter? And this is something that Tesla Twitter and uh, JPR007 on Twitter noticed was this uh, announcement that Shift4 Payments had that they had signed up to do all of Starlink's payments globally for the next five years and essentially starting in the first quarter of next year. Uh, right now, Shift4 is um, based in the US uh, and does most of their business in the US. So this move uh, not only exposes them to Shift4, but also kind of forces them to innovate and to grow and handle payments on more of a global basis. Um, exposes pretty, them to Starlink. I think you said exposes yes. them to Shift4, yes. Okay. Yes, exposes them to Starlink. And uh, you know, based off of the size of their business today and how much they process today, which is pretty significant, the Starlink business would be meaningful to their business. It may not be a, a majority, but it would still be meaningful. I thought it was an interesting thing and I wanted to share it as soon as I could communicate okay. half decent. And and the, the, the CEO of Shift4 is Jared Isaacman, who was the customer for the Inspiration4 launch. For those who aren't familiar with that, there is a mm -hmm. documentary series on Netflix about a SpaceX launch of four non-professional astronauts into space on Falcon mm -hmm. 9. I will confess or, or brag that along with three others, we did a, a an homage to Inspiration4. We did the Inspiration420 journey across the United States and mm -hmm. the Tesla Model 3 I bought from Omar Kazi. So Jared Isaacman paid, Tes, uh, paid SpaceX some large sum of money for this launch that they did. Mm -hmm. They raised $200 million or more for St. Jude, is that correct? Yeah, 200 or 250 million. Because Elon yeah. chipped in 50 million at the end, if I, if I got that right. That's right. So in doing so, Isaacman really got to know the people at SpaceX very well because they spent several months preparing for this mission. Mm -hmm. And he was the leader of the mission, the, the lead guy working with SpaceX on all of this. Mm -hmm. So that, that explains how he got to know the SpaceX people so well. Right. And that series is called Countdown. Um, he may have had some kind of personal investment in SpaceX before. I don't know. He, he does have a long-term history in the payments business. He's been doing uh, payments since he's been 16 years old. Yeah, Isaac Mint is a billionaire who mm -hmm. built his own business from scratch from a young age. Uh, and the documentary goes through his life a little bit as well. That's in the first episode or two, they talk about the different players the, the four people who went on the launch. My understanding is right now, Starlink has 140,000 customers paying roughly $100 a month or $1,000 a year, let's call it. But you and I both expect that Starlink is going to grow to much, much larger than that, to a million customers, maybe 10. I'm of the view they're going to be well over 100 million customers down the road. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of that? It's hard to say. Um, I think Comcast, if you look at Comcast, their revenues... And they have some other stuff from like content generation, all that. Their revenues are over 300 billion, I believe, um, or it, it's at least over 100 billion. So you, just, you think about, you know, what Tesla has been able to do with their, um, how much they've disrupted the automobile market, and they might be headed to becoming a revenue leader in automobiles. You know, why couldn't Starlink become a revenue leader in uh, global internet. Well, sort of let me right. make let me make that pitch really quick because I am a Starlink nut. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a SpaceX nut. I'm an Elon nut. I'm wearing this sh this shirt as a quote from Elon. What? Yeah, t-shirts at elonbits.com. What's outside the simulation? That's from an interview with Lex Friedman. Starlink is basically an internet service provider. 
that you are able to get internet service, high speed, low latency, high bandwidth internet anywhere on earth, in an airplane, on a cruise ship, in the middle of the ocean. Now, not all of this is accessible yet, but this is all coming. And my initial, when I started analyzing this, if you search my channel for Starlink, you'll see a video I did about this. I was kind of coming up with, our, let's say they could do 100 million customers globally. And then right after I made the video, there was a, a survey done in the United States showing there are 65 million for custom, there are 65 million customers for Starlink in the United States alone. That's people who don't have reliable high speed broadband access uh -huh. who can afford Starlink, which is $100 a month. So if it's 65 million in the United States alone, and you know, these are people who don't live in the middle of a city, they live somewhere. It doesn't have to be that rural, but there are just spots. There, there's a lot of rural areas that have poor internet access, but there's a lot of areas that aren't really that rural, but just don't have great internet access. And we're not yeah. used to seeing that. But if it's 65 million in the US alone, and you're gonna add, I think they're already in 20 countries, you're probably talking about maybe 300 million customers potentially that uh -huh. really can't be served by wired internet that you know, the, the fiber optic providers can't in a cost-effective manner deliver high-speed internet access to a lot of these customers. Right. And then you have this sort of first mover advantage in orbit, right? Having an orbital satellite platform to deliver internet services because Starship is gonna be able to deliver those satellites into orbit for such low cost, lower cost than anybody else has any shot of doing. And because SpaceX is scaling up the manufacturing of Starlink satellites and the, the, the receivers at such a large scale, their cost of building out this system from the entire system is gonna be fairly low. And for somebody else to come along and build a competing platform, they're not gonna have low cost satellites. They're not gonna have low cost launch. They're not gonna have low cost uh, hardware for the consumer. Their costs are gonna be so much higher that the market opportunity for a number two is going to be dubious. Does all yeah. of that make sense to you? Yeah, and on top of that, um, SpaceX, SpaceX is already innovating on their satellites. So with the satellite laser links, that might help them reduce their costs. If SpaceX doesn't need to advertise a whole lot. Starline doesn't need to advertise much. Um, it may need to advertise for it in like Asian countries that aren't as familiar with Tesla, that kind of thing. But um, there's a lot of a lot of demand for it already. I think over 500,000 people have raised their hand. And well, said, what, what works for Tesla, because Tesla doesn't advertise, what works for Tesla is word of mouth. Right. That, that you know, I, I have a Tesla Model 3, a 2018 mm -hmm. Model 3 that I've had for a few months. And I just, I keep taking people for rides. I just took a friend for a ride today. I, I keep taking people for rides, probably three or four times a week, I take somebody for a ride so I can show off FSD data or show off the car. Nobody buys a Toyota Camry and says, hey, you got to go for a ride in my Camry. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine in a rural community, somebody gets Starlink and all of a sudden they have much better internet than they had before. They're going to tell their neighbors, hey, you got to try this, right? right. It's, it's going to spread just because the communities where it's useful are communities where everybody goes to the same grocery store. They, they go to the same places, mm -hmm. the same events, and it's a kind of a natural, and you know, somebody gets it. And my, my cousin has a, an early Starlink customer, lives off a dirt road in Southern New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And you know, he had satellite internet before, but it wasn't low latency, the bandwidth wasn't that good and it was expensive. Yeah. It's terrible. And, <laughs> and, he, and he's psyched. He loves it. So people who get a product or service that they actually love, they tell their friends. Mm -hmm. They tell their family. So yeah. And people in rural communities, they learn to really lean on each other. Like in the winters, they really have to help each other out, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I, so I, I agree that this uh, word of mouth should uh, work in its favor for sure. Yeah. And I, I just think that we're going to expect to see massive growth with minimal or no advertising. Um, and then, but I was trying to get to this point that if they, let's suppose the market is 300 million customers paying $1,000 a year, uh -huh. right? That's $300 billion a year in revenue just on the internet service, assuming they don't provide other services like you mentioned the satellite links, the inter-satellite laser links uh -huh. that will enable 
service to cruise ships that will enable service to you know something that's over the ocean the problem with somebody who's in the middle of the ocean is the satellite overhead what the way the satellites currently work is they get your signal and they beam it down to a ground station in, you know immediately but with uh -huh. the with the satellite laser links they'll be able to hit a, a satellite that's in the middle of the ocean that doesn't have access to a ground station will be able to transmit to another satellite to another satellite till something's over land and down and Elon has talked about it, and it makes obvious sense. They may start carrying traffic on their satellite network entirely and not bother going through the the, the wired internet at all um, right. for some traffic. And then you have like high- yeah, He mentioned this at the World uh, Mobile Congress in Barcelona in 2021, you know, partnering with those data centers and you know beaming directly from the the data center to to the satellite. So like if if a farmer in Illinois plows through the internet cable that runs through Illinois, it's not going to take down half the country. Right. You know, yeah. And just operate. If I could just hit this model a little clearer. So you've got $300 billion in revenue, the cost of putting their satellites in orbit, they proposed a satellite network, the larger version is like 45,000, let's say satellites. And the launch cost on Starship is going to get down to around $5,000, yeah. which is basically zero compared to all the other costs. The cost of the satellites, I, the last I heard, they were under $250,000 a satellite and they weren't producing them at scale like I think they're going to. So I don't. I wouldn't be surprised to see that get down to $100,000 a satellite. And then you've got the hardware for the consumer, which the consumer pays for. So, and, and the consumer gets a subsidy. Don't, let's not, at least at the, the previous generation of hardware, the consumer was getting subsidized the cost of the right. hardware. It was five hundred dollars for them to buy the hardware, and it probably cost SpaceX a thousand or more to make it. Right. Exactly. But they make that up over time. It becomes a trivial cost. So if you have forty-five thousand satellites in orbit, and as I understand it, the expectation is that each satellite will last five years. I'm sure there'll be some variation, but a ballpark of five years. So you have to replace nine thousand satellites a year. So call it ten thousand satellites a year. You have to launch at a hundred thousand dollars a piece. You're at a billion dollars a year in cost. Right. I, I think my numbers are right. So you're getting three hundred billion dollars a year in revenue for a billion dollars in cost. You can ten mm. x the cost and say it's ten billion dollars, and it's yeah, still the cost, the cost isn't really that significant. I think what what's significant is what's the capability and and what's the total market. So right now, um, the FCC has approved Starlink to do twelve thousand satellites. And the satellites can do um, 20 gigabits per second, um, so that gives them uh, that gives them a lot. Let's <laughs> get 300 uh, terabits a second, something like that. It's they, they're able to serve each satellite because each customer is not necessarily 240 of them, but because each customer is not using, you know, the satellites, you know, like right now you and I are using a fair amount of bandwidth because we're right. stream, we're streaming up and down. But a lot of customers are on Twitter. A mm -hmm. lot of customers are doing low bandwidth things. Yeah. So they're able to serve a fairly large volume of customers so that 12,000 satellites can serve millions of people. And, and the right. 45,000 satellites that I think are coming are going to be able to serve probably more than 100 million people. And, and so you end up with, from the SpaceX end, from the Starlink end, you end up with this ridiculous cash cow, just an insane amount of revenue with nearly zero costs. So it's almost all margin. So that turns us to shift four. Right? right, so you have SpaceX servings with Starlink serving, let's say, hundred million customers, what and, and paying, let's say, thousand dollars a year. What chunk of that does Shift Four get? So when they're processing the payments, it's like um, anywhere from a half a percent to 0.7 percent, and that that sounds like a a small amount, but when you when you take a hundred, let's say it's a hundred million customers and the, let's say the, they already have their their starlink terminal so it's 120 billion in revenue you take that you multiply by um 0.7 percent and you get something like uh uh 840 million dollars and, and what's in, what's shift for what's shift for its current annual revenue their current annual revenue, and this this includes credit card fees. So it's it's a little complicated. Is uh, one point uh, one or one point two billion, roughly. So this would 
almost two x the company revenue, and that's that's assuming right. there isn't other revenue, like they're not selling others, to, they're not processing other payments through Starlink. Yeah, the um, what they're doing right now is they're they're projecting uh, by the end of twenty twenty four that their gross revenue less network fees is going to be one point two billion, and that that gross revenue with credit card fees is three and a half billion. So um, this is what Shift 4 is projecting with their medium term outlook. They're estimating that this five year deal that they have with Starlink, that they're gonna process a total of 100 billion in transactions. And, and right now they're doing about 200 billion. Okay, but so it's like a, Starlink's it's a, not going to be done growing then, and you know maybe by the end of that five years, they're at you know four, 40 million or something like that. It's not like it's half of the business, but it's still meaningful. Okay, so what's what's Shift Four trading at now? What's their market cap? What, what what's what kind of numbers do you have on that? Yeah, their market cap is about five point five billion. Uh, you compare that to some other payment processors like uh, Stripe is reported to be valued at 95 billion. Um, Square is valued at over hundred billion, that kind of thing. It's, it's a very competitive space. And you know we can get onto how Shift 4 differentiates themselves a little bit, but there's definitely a lot of players. But what's interesting to me is like, Starlink is the lifeblood of SpaceX. And a kind of deal like this, this is a deal that Elon would have approved. Like of course. I'm 99% I'm certain. So if, if this is the oh, lifeblood of your business. Let's, let's be clear about this. I believe that Elon still owns more than 50% of SpaceX. Yeah. So yeah. every decision is really his decision. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and we got to remember, Elon knows the payments uh industry he he sold paypal like he he knows what you can and you want to try and do with payments um you know he had he had dreams on what, where he wanted to take paypal and then you know get his way but for him to choose shift four it wasn't like oh thank you for buying a ride on the inspiration Four rocket you know <laughs> with these other people it it's um some kind of validation of the technology, but I'm guessing that Shift 4 did really good on cost. And um, I think it just allows, you know, Starlink to focus on the rest of their business. They're gonna make it easier for, for Starlink. Well, I mean, you know, Elon is friends with Jack Dorsey who runs Square. So he right. could have easily made a similar deal with Square. Yep. And he chose to go with Jared Isaac, but now, Jack Dorsey didn't pay for a Falcon 9 launch. Right? <laughs> Jack Dorsey's busy with other stuff. He's got a lot of other things going on. But going back to Shift 4, so they get this deal with SpaceX to do Starlink. Does this position them to expand their business beyond Starlink? Does this help them grow in other ways? In other words, like you mentioned, Stripe and, and other payment processors having much yeah. larger market caps. What are those other companies doing that gets them such a larger market cap than Shift 4? And how does Shift 4 grow to capture a much bigger part of the payment space or, or whatever other business that they need to grow into? Yeah, what, what Stripe and others do is they've made it a lot easier for web developers to like make, make a web page and throw it up there and do it quick. Uh, what, what Shift 4 has going against them is like it's not as easy to put up an e-commerce page. But what what who they serve really well is hotels, restaurants, um, sporting events, casinos. It, you think about a hotel, you know, not only do you have your room, but you have the the restaurant downstairs, you got the bar, you might have a spa, you might have a golf course. And to get ever get all these talking to each other and to get it on the final bill. And, and maybe you have a, your pay-per-view or your room service too. Um, and to do it in a secure way, this is what um, Shift 4 does really well. You know, Stripe is more for a, a more simple business where it can all live on one app, that kind of thing. Or if you think about a restaurant, you have all these online orders 
coming from different sources and like you have DoorDash and Grubhub and all this stuff. Yeah. And you want to bring it all into one thing and not have like four different iPads you're dealing with. You know, uh, you and I are both fans of Kathy Wood and Ark Invest. And mm -hmm. I believe Kathy Wood frequently talks about, I think it's Square as a big right. potential play in finance, if I'm not mistaken. That, that right. um, I don't think I've seen her talk, because I get her emails every week, the, the ARK Invest emails. I don't think I've seen her talk about Shift 4. Is it that Shift 4 is just small enough that others haven't noticed it yet? Because, you know, $5 billion market cap right. is a pretty small company by comparison to Square. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Square and Stripe have a lot more attention because their customer ba their customer base is essentially smaller people and, and individual customers who are using it. Like, I don't, there, is there a shift for like, you know, thing I can get on my phone so I can start paying for stuff with shift for, I don't think they've gone to the consumer, right? They're not a B2C play yet. Yeah. Uh, payments is usually on the merchant side. Um, right. So Stripe is on the merchant side. But I have, I think I have like Square or Cash App on my phone, right? There's certain... Mm -hmm. I, Cash app I definitely have on my phone is do you think shift four might head in that direction or is that just you know their core competency is serving large businesses. Yeah, to my knowledge they're not like trying to collect cash balances yet. Um, so that's you know collecting cash balances is something else that PayPal does and they can make money on the cash balances while, while it sits there that kind of thing but. Do do you, I haven't heard about Shift 4 doing that. Do you think in addition to the $100 a month that Starlink is going to get from their customers, there's other kinds of ways that Starlink will be able to monetize its customer base? You know, are they, they could sell Tesla insurance, you know, use Starlink to, to promote Tesla insurance, just as an example, I'm just given something in the middle of nowhere, but um, what do internet, you know, like you mentioned Comcast before, what yeah. do internet providers sell on top of their internet service like you know they are they selling like they're selling netflix and they're getting a cut of the netflix revenue or ha, ha, is there another way they make money i'm talking about starlink now and then does that translate to yeah. money for shift four yeah one of the things that like comcast does is they collect money from netflix so that your netflix goes smooth or they used they used to do that that might have gotten stopped by legislation um I guess where I think the bigger opportunity is, is like if, if the Starlink opportunity isn't big enough or overwhelming enough, it's like, okay, if Shift 4 is very cost effective compared to other payment people, who's Tesla going to use moving forward oh. for their subscription business? So you have, you know, FSD subscriptions, you got insurance subscriptions. They get a chance to see how well Shift 4 does with that. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was a lot bigger than I was ready for. Uh, what if Shift 4 does such a great job for Starlink that yeah. Elon decides, hey, we should use Shift 4 for Tesla? Yeah. Because Tesla is a really big business and it could even yeah, get they down to... Yeah, they, I, I want to caution people. They wouldn't like do the, the car payments, like huge payments like that, that goes through the bank, that goes through wiring, that, that kind of thing. But, you know, why not on the smaller stuff? I, I don't know how, you know, payments work. I'm not a programmer. I'm not an integrator or anything like that. Um, but I, I think that's an interesting possibility. Well, because and, Tesla already has, the, they're already processing those payments in volume, yeah. right? The, the premium connectivity, the I want to, I want to up, update my software to get the $2,000, you know, acceleration mm -hmm. upgrade, whatever. Um, it does seem like there's potential with, you know, millions of Teslas on the road that there could be some kind of play there for shift four to get into that business as well. And you could, you could even get into the boring company scaling and Neuralink scaling and somehow they get in on those businesses too, that Isaac meant if he, if he is able to demonstrate to Elon, I'm providing this payment service to you better than anybody else is going to. It's easy for Elon to say, let's not worry about shopping that stuff around. We know that Jared's going to take care of this for us. So mm -hmm. let's give him this business as well. I mean, Elon's going to tend to make uh, vendors compete. Right. But, you know, they, cho they chose Shift 4 for a reason. It wasn't just because they bought a rocket launch. Mm -hmm. Right. And what we know is, you know, despite Tesla uh, producing a really high quality car, 
they are cost conscious. They do look for ways to cut some costs out of things. Like they're looking at getting rid of the lumbar support on the passenger side of some car. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. When I have a guest in my car, you know, they won't have lumbar support. But um, so they're looking for things to kind of just shave a little money. Like they're not using the best cameras. They don't, they apparently don't need to, you know. So where else are they going to look to cut costs? And, you know, one of the ways they're, they're helping people cut costs is on the insurance side. There was a big deal on the third quarter earnings report about helping the consumer save costs. No, and but maybe, when you mentioned robo taxi, when you, yeah, if they, pro if they process the robo taxi payments, that's the, yeah. you know what I think about the robo taxi market, the robo taxi yeah. market is a multi-trillion dollar market. And then you could be processing Tesla bot payments too. You know, that I, I need a bot to come over to my house to do some work. And the, the, the scale of potential for Tesla to be producing revenue in so many different ways, if Shift 4 gets a piece of that, that, that could 10x what they're getting from Starlink. There's, there's a bunch of little payments that would happen with a, a potential robo-taxi network. Yeah. And, and if you're paying, I, I don't know what Tesla's paying now, but if they're paying Stripe, 30 cents a transaction, um, you know, they're, they're going to want to pay someone else 20 or 10 cents a transaction. Yeah. No. And even like in the robo taxi sphere, I, I imagine why not, why wouldn't your robo taxi ha be able to sell Coca-Cola, right? You, yeah. you have like a Coke machine in the robo taxi. Would you like a soda? It's only a dollar. Of course it only costs Tesla 10 cents for the Coke, or maybe it's a cup of coffee or maybe it's a snack or something like that. Or you're, you're, you want to work out a long ride. Do you want to watch a movie? Do you mm -hmm. want to play a video game? There's all kinds of things that Tesla's going to be able to offer in that robo-taxi. So if she, that would be, see, the, the Starlink is sort of the entry point for Isaacman and Shift 4 to demonstrate to Elon that mm -hmm. we're the best payment processor you're going to get, and we will compete for your business. And they can afford to make a little bit less profit on the business for Starlink because they, because Isaacman can see that opportunity down the road. Isaacman's right. a smart guy. So, all right. So this is exciting. And, and the, I, I, the other thing is the other thing, Warren, is the potential global rollout of what they're already doing well. So, you know, they're already doing really well in restaurants, um, hotels, uh, sporting event places. So if, if you begin processing payments in Canada, if you be, begin processing them in Germany and Australia and all the stuff, then the, the payments people who go into these businesses and you know, sell them on a, a software solution and a, a integrated solution to handle everything, um, they're gonna be going in there and pitch and shift for and, and getting some more wins for them. It's like, to me, like, okay, shift four sounds interesting. It sounds like it's a potential play. This is a company could two, three, five X as a result of this deal. And if something happens with Tesla could 10 X or more, I'm still excited about Starlink. Uh -huh. And, you know, the rumors about Starlink's IPO keep flying. I think Elon keeps poo-pooing it. You know, it's going to take a while before they're ready to IPO. But if we're looking at a company that's going to have millions of customers paying a thousand dollars a year, right? That's a very large business. And I see huge profits here. There's been rumors floating around about an IPO for Starlink at you know a hundred billion dollar valuation. Then I just saw one the other day where they were saying a potential three or four hundred billion dollar valuation at IPO. I I would still be buying at a four hundred billion dollar valuation. I mean, do you do you have a sense of when you think Starlink might IPO and what it would be valued at when it IPOs? I mean, let's face it. If Rivian is worth one hundred and forty billion dollars today, or I don't know, it's up and down. You know, if if Lucid Motors is worth ninety billion dollars, you know we know the ISP market is huge. We already know Starlink works. This seems like mm -hmm. a no-brainer to me. But do you have a sense of what that company could IPO at, and when? I think what what Shift Four shared in their investor deck, and that's on their investor relations website. It's called Investor Field Day slides, and it's with their third quarter report is that the, the Starlink uh, revenue opportunity, they believe to be a hundred billion over five years. So what I'm guessing is that it may represent some of the best thinking from uh, both Starlink and Shift 4 on, on how quickly Starlink's gonna grow. Maybe in year five, it, 
it's uh, 45 billion in revenue, that kind of thing. So, you know, I agree with you. Um, they don't they don't need to reserve 150 megabytes per customer. So the amount of satellites they have could serve a lot of people. They, they are limited on how many customers they could have in the US right now to like 5 million or something like that. It's kind of silly. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's that's a temporary limit. And as they grow, yeah. you know, even, even Biden's uh, plan, you know, I don't know whether the Biden administration is going to want Starlink to get all this revenue, but the Biden administration is pushing to expand broadband access. And Starlink yeah. is the least expensive way to expand broadband access because you don't have to lay wires. Yeah. You know, I think I think I, unfortunately Biden, like they're they're doing this as a last ditch before Starlink really gets it going. It, it kind of like a last ditch gift to the other players. <laughs> well, to the other players and to the unions that 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 represent the workers who right. do the work. But you know, you uh, Starlink is Starlink is going to be partnering with other telecoms at the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. Uh, Elon said that they pretty much made two deals already with other telecoms and are working on more. Um, so these these telecoms they want to be they want to serve the rural area and they have these mandates giving given to them by their their governments that they need to do that. So Starlink gives them a way to do that in a much more economic way. Um, it, so let's say Starlink in in five years gets to like forty five billion in revenue. Um, you know what what should it trade at today, or what should it trade at in a few years? And um, you know, I I think numbers you've you've thrown out are are reasonable and and probably still on the low side as far as um, what it could be worth. Um, there's a ton of risk in what we're talking about. We're talking about something that's going to grow just by, <laughs> you know, order of magnitude from where it is today and even more than that. So uh, two orders of magnitude, like more than a hundred times. So for, they need to execute on that. And there's a well, lot of risk, risk so in that. Elon talks about how previous efforts to have uh, satellite based internet have failed and gone bankrupt. And they need to get through the chasm of negative cash flow, which they're right. certainly obviously. You know, if they if they needed to raise money in this market, if the, you consider the amount of money that Rivian and Lucid have raised, it's certainly possible for them to raise money. And of course, Elon can cut a check if he has to. Mm. But when you look down the road, the the key advantage that Starlink has over other satellite based internet providers is there's a few keys. One is it's just better, right? Lower latency. Lower latency for people who aren't familiar with it means when you when you click the button, the length of time it takes for your request to reach the internet site that you're communicating with is 20 milliseconds instead of 20 seconds, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, it's an instant internet instead of a delayed internet. And bandwidth is high, so you're, you're able to download multiple video streams at the same time. Those are two of the keys. On the cost side, their cost of getting their satellites into orbit is way below what anybody else has done before. Mm -hmm. They're yeah. able to make the satellites for less money and they're producing the satellites. Instead of launching one big satellite that goes into geosynchronous orbit, you know, really far above the Earth's surface, they're making a lot of smaller satellites that travel faster over, a, a, you know, that fly by your house and the, the network operates differently, but it's already working for 140,000 customers. So mm -hmm. we know it works. Um, and we know the cost is much below what it was before. And, you know, you could do some math and you could see this is going to succeed. So uh, this is, you know, I don't know whether the Mars mission is going to be a, a commercial success, right? I don't fully understand the launch business for SpaceX and, yeah. um, you know, how much of a launch business there is once you launch Starship and you're able to take, you know, 100 times as much payload into orbit a year. You know, if you build it, will they come? Are the customers there for that? But the Starlink business is, is a no-brainer to me. So. Yeah. I, I and, see. And the, and the good thing about it, let's say you're a SpaceX investor and you own all of that. You know, one concern people might have is Elon's going to spend a lot of money going to Mars. But if Starlink is successful as you say it's going to be, they're going to have trouble spending that much money every year trying to get to Mars and well, trying to support Mars. Well, I have a theory about that. Let's talk about that for a second. So I have my sure. own. I have my own theory about the business case for Mars. 
The big question is, let's suppose it, I believe it's going to cost a trillion dollars to build a Mars okay. colony. OK, and, and, and the, can you put a little weight behind that? Sure. Two hundred thousand dollars a person, a million people. That's two hundred okay. million dollars to get a million people to Mars. All right. And then figure it's four times as much per person to get the stuff there that you need to support them. OK, and this is a seat of the pants estimate. But I mean, two hundred thousand dollars a person is the number that SpaceX has talked yeah. about as when they're delivering passengers to Mars at scale, it will be two hundred thousand dollars for a ticket. Okay. okay, and that's probably carrying some stuff with you in the first place, right? Not just a couple suitcases, right? You're carrying a lot of stuff with you because uh -huh. it's a it's a thirty month journey. So you know you're it's if, if you're if you're coming home, it's a thirty month journey. It's six months there, eighteen months on Mars, and six months back. It, you you can't do it quicker. Maybe you can get the six months to three months, so it's uh, a twenty four month journey. But you know you're uh -huh. you're not go, doing that on a couple suitcases. If you figure two hundred billion dollars to get the people there and eight hundred billion dollars to get the stuff there, that's a trillion dollars. Now. I don't trust any government to fund that, right? No, no right. government, you know, maybe some governments will chip in a little bit, but there's one customer I could see who will probably be able to write the check for the whole mission. And his name is Elon Musk. Right. I see Tesla becoming a $10 trillion company or more, $50 trillion company potentially, and Elon owns 20% of Tesla. Mm -hmm. And I see Starlink being worth one to 5 trillion and Elon owns half of that. I think this is why in general, if they can hold off from doing it, they're going to avoid IPOing Starlink just because the longer, the longer they have it, the more it can grow well, outside of like the, the faith of Wall Street. Like but Wall, you, as soon as Wall Street looks at Starlink, they're going to be like, well, it's growing 100% a year. Let's say that's the reality. Like Wall Street's going to be like, yeah, it's going to grow 30% a year. And okay, but, just... <laughs> but, but here's the thing. When they IPO Starlink, they don't. The question is, how much money do they need to raise to build out the network? Right. And if they need yeah. to raise ten billion dollars to build out the network, and they do it at a hundred billion dollar valuation, they only have to sell ten percent of Starlink. But if they do it at a four hundred billion dollar valuation, they only have to sell two and a half percent of Starlink. Yeah, that's so, right. So, so the investors who already own Starlink through SpaceX are making a killing, right? They still own, you know, Elon still owns half of the company right? Because he's only sold two and a half percent of it in the IPO. Uh -huh. He's raised as much money as he needs to raise to build it out. The, the, yeah. start, the SpaceX investors are all thrilled because now they're getting their, their Starlink stock and they can sell and cash out somewhat. Yeah. But I just see that the Mars mission is funded by Elon saying, all right, I now have a net worth of $5 trillion. I can pay for the Mars colony with 20% of my net worth. Uh, right. And, you know, you know, Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden are going to like rant about, well, why should billionaires be able to build a Mars colony when we've got to solve world hunger? You know, mm -hmm. it's just you, you can see the ranting, but it's like, well, wait a minute. I, this is the, the actually the striking thing is you watch the Bernie Sanders rant, the Robert Reich rants, the, all these people yeah. trashing the billionaires. And the thing is, they keep making the mistake. It's one thing to attack Jeff Bezos, who's just, you know, annoying or Bill Gates, who's annoying. Mm -hmm. People like Elon. They're, they're going after someone who's likable. He's got 62 million followers on Twitter. He's just fundamentally a likable guy. You know, he, he's open, he's honest, he's straightforward, he's vulnerable. You know, he's, he's a, an attractive personality. And it's like they drop these bombs on Elon and they just bounce off and end up blowing up in their faces. So <laughs> I, I think that, you know, the pitch of, hey, let's build a Mars colony is something that a lot of people are like, okay, there's, you know, the... The, the Luddites don't like it, but there's an awful lot of people are like, well, this is pretty cool. Yeah. You know, and think about the TV angle on this, that the first mission to Mars, how mm -hmm. much revenue is that? You know, the, how, you know, you think that the, <laughs> the countdown documentary did well for yeah. how much would Netflix pay for the Mars documentary? Yeah. I don't think Amazon Prime is going to be a buyer. I don't think Jeff Bezos <laughs> is going to be in on it, but I think, you know, that's, they're going to make $10 billion on the documentary. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know how much I don't know if Elon would do this, but you know, what if you started advertising products on the Mars mission? Right. Mm -hmm. And I actually kind of wonder, like, if at some point does Bezos give up on the competition with Elon? At some point, does he say uncle and say, you know, listen, this blue origin thing really isn't gonna matter? Yeah. So I think somehow that they should work together if, if there's I, I would love to see Jeff Bezos yeah. get on board and say, Hey, 
you know what, Elon's got the right idea. I'm going to support this mission. And maybe maybe we can build an O'Neill colony along the way, right? Because Bezos wants to build these orbiting colonies that are large, uh -huh. you know. I, I, and if Amazon was at, was essentially a sponsor of the mission, right? You could see ways that they could work together and make this happen. So I, I anyway, all right, we've been talking for a while. Um, Shift 4 is an interesting play. For me, I see Starlink as such a... Now, if Starlink IPOs at 400 billion, 400 billion, I'm not sure it, you know, it, it could 10x from there. But, you know, I, I sort of have a reasonable limit of the market cap of, of Starlink is somewhere between one and five trillion when it's fully built out. Maybe there's some more there that I'm not seeing. So even well, like a... Yeah, so... Um... Let's say they got to a point where they had uh, 300 million customers. That's, yes. that's pretty extreme and pretty wild. And would be pretty awesome if it happened. That would be great for society. It's possible they would have 300 billion in profits just from the Starlink constellation. Gross profit, yeah. Yeah. Um, so if you look at that, I, I don't see why. And let's say it's for whatever reason, it just stops growing or it hits some kind of limit. Um, by itself, um, if you put a 10x multiple on that, a 10 times multiple, then you come up with a, a $3 trillion number. Well, I, I would take it a different way. If I'm and correct- this is, we're, I'm just playing with napkin math. It's not- yeah, But let me, let, me do a different, let me do a different napkin math. My napkin math is most of that is profit and then call it, you know, say the net income is two thirds of the of the gross profit, and you. I'm just again, this is napkin math, and you could cut this more, but you got two hundred billion dollars in net income, and you fifty mm. x that for for a price earnings ratio, you're at ten trillion. Well, to do a fifty x, it's still got to be growing like at least ten percent a year, if not more. So, but all right, so so my point is, you get to ten trillion at fifty at at a fifty at price earnings ratio, so knock it down to a twenty five, and you're at a five trillion dollar market cap. Yeah. So yep. if you buy in on the IPO at 400 billion, you still got more than 10x potential. Yeah. And then we don't even know what other ways they can monetize Starlink. You know, I think Elon has said that ultimately they're going to lower the price. It's not going to be 12, you know, 100 dollars a month. He wants to get the price down. But there, there's so much room for growth. I think there. it'd be good if he did, but like, yeah, my parents had satellite internet for a long time, and they still might. And it's just like it's terrible. <laughs> I love them for having some internet, but satellite internet is just terrible. Yeah. You know, are you, Elon, are you getting them? Are you getting them to get Starlink? I I did order Starlink for myself. I probably should order it for my mom too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you want her to appreciate you, that'll do it for you. <laughs> All right. So listen, we've been going for about you know for a while. Um, I I pretty. Is there anything else you wanted to add before we wrap this up? No, I think this has been great. You give me some things to think about. And uh, I just want to get this idea out there, uh, get more feedback, get more more brains looking at it. Um, awesome. I'm not saying that's a good or bad idea. I just thought it was interesting. And JPR007 was the one who found this out. Yeah. So uh, just really quick, I want to thank you again. This is Bradford Ferguson of Halter Ferguson Financial, one of my favorite professional investment advisors in the world. If you don't mind, I'd like to thank the Vasa Law Firm in Sweden and all my Patreon yes. supporters for helping this channel grow. Please support the channel on Patreon. Check out the t-shirts at elonbits.com and, uh, and check out my channel, The Daily Lie, where I talk about politics and things that I can't talk about on YouTube. So thank you, Bradford, and thanks everyone for watching.